Well, we're joined again by the former Foreign Secretary, Sir Malcolm Rifkind, the Pulitzer Prize-winning journalist Anne Applebaum, ex-Kremlin advisor Alexander Nekrasov, and James Jeffrey, who served as Deputy National Security Advisor under President Bush. Well, James Jeffrey first, then. Uh, it is the case, is it not, that a, a divided West that was paralysed over Syria is now... That has now empowered Putin, has it not? Uh, it may have, but remember, this was self paralyzation uh, The West acted decisively in Libya just a year before, and it could act again if it so wanted. Well, what, how should it act, in your view? Well, first of all, you have to separate it right now, just as with uh, Georgia in 2008. Uh, hours and days matter. We need to uh, talk urgently to the Russians again. We probably should have the president calling uh, Turchinov, not simply uh, Secretary Kerry, possibly putting people uh, that is diplomatic uh, uh, liaison on the ground with the Ukrainians to show them that uh, oh, we consider them a UN member state and we consider this aggression. But at the moment, uh, we have to be very careful because we don't want to provoke Putin. In the larger uh, in, uh, sense, exactly what uh, uh, Sir Malcolm said is uh, on target. We need to reconsider how we've been looking at the world since 1990 if Putin's going to continue these things. Well, and having advised President Bush over the Russia-Georgia war in 2008, as we've discussed, this feels, does it not, infinitely more serious? This is far more serious. First of all, uh, Shashkash, it's a much bigger and much more strategically important country. Shashkash really brought it on himself to some degree by initiating the attack against Russian uh, peacekeepers in South Ossetia. And to some degree, uh, part of the bargain after 1990 was uh, allegedly that we shouldn't be putting NATO flags uh, in former parts of the Soviet uh, Union other than the Baltics. So uh, it was more controversial. This is very clear. This is a clear case, as Secretary Kerry said, of aggression and occupation, and it needs to be condemned, and we're going to have to react against it if Putin doesn't stand down quickly. Well, Alexander Nekrasov, the Russia-Georgia war ended up with the pro-EU Georgian president being ousted and, and Georgia returning to the Russian sphere of influence. Is there going to be a similar conclusion here, do you think? Well, in Ukraine it happened the same with the Orange Revolution. All these politicians uh, were thrown out of power, lost the election, and uh, it's uh, actually, I find it quite uh, amusing, this uh, sense of uh, annoyance coming from uh, Western politicians with, who have badly misjudged what the response would be of Russia when they meddled into Ukrainian affairs and installed a regime breaking, by the way, the next day after the, uh, the agreement was signed, brokered by the EU on the 21st of February. Well, now they're telling us meddling, it's Russia. Got... It's Russia that has, you see, is well, a, it's is aggressive. Troops going it's in, isn't remarkable, it? isn't it? Because we have seen what was happening in Kyiv. We have seen direct involvement of Western politicians coming over to Kyiv, encouraging those protesters who were armed, by the way, who were using thugs, armed thugs, to shoot at the police. And now we're hearing all these wonderful scenarios of, of, of Russia attacking, uh, invading uh, Ukraine. Well, let me bring in Anne Applebaum. Western let, meddling. Let's, let's be really clear about what happened. Um, there was a deal signed. It was broken by EU, uh, brokered by EU foreign ministers. <clears throat> Immediately after the deal was signed, President Yanukovych left his building. Uh, he recalled all security troops to leave all government buildings in Kiev, and then he left the country. In other words, he had no intention of ever seeing through the deal. The deal ended immediately as soon as it was signed. Um, what happened next has been almost from a playbook. It was clearly planned. Um, there's been a series of fake separatist um, uh, demonstrations all over Ukraine, um, and, and, and the Russian army is coming in. So let's, let's be absolutely clear that the West did not provoke what is happening now. Um, it was a Russian decision to intervene, um, and in fact, nobody expected it, and, no, and people have been extremely surprised. Sir so Malcolm Rifkind, uh, Western meddling, so what should the West do now in terms of sanctions? Well, the contribution of your Russian colleague shows exactly the rather sad and depressing mindset that still exists in Moscow. They think of Ukraine as some sort of semi-independent colony, which they have a particular right to interfere in. We are told that because a British or an American or other European politicians go to Kiev, that is meddling of an unacceptable kind. But for Russian troops to invade the territory of another country, uh, that somehow is an acceptable form of behavior. 
We, this is why this is not just a Ukrainian crisis. This is a European crisis. You cannot have Russia as the only country in Europe that believes it has a right on its own determination to send its troops over its borders into the territory of another state. No other European country claims that right. No other country has tried to exercise such okay. a right. L and let this me ask is why this is so dangerous. Alexander Nekrasov, if you could respond to that, please. Well, I would like to respond very simply. Pretty rich of politicians uh, talking about Russia invading Ukraine when we have, uh, you know, the, the terrible examples of Iraq and other countries that have been invaded directly and turned into hellholes, by the way, by the, by the Western countries and NATO. And another thing is that, that uh, we are hearing about sanctions and punishment uh, that, that Russia is supposed to be put through. I can tell you something. Mr. President Putin is more concerned what his people are thinking rather than who is going to come to the G8. And G8, by the way, is already half dead. And, and I can tell you, this is the more important thing. And he has got support. And also, the giant in the East, the Russian-speaking population, have woken up to the coup which the West has supported. Okay. So they will not tolerate this anymore. OK, James Jeffrey, sanctions won't, won't work. Uh, sanctions are not going to change Putin's worldview or the worldview of much of the Russian people. We're getting a good example of this. What we need to do is to restructure our approach to international relations. We need to push the transatlantic trade and investment treaty with Europe, which will allow the U.S. to export gas, among many other things, to Europe, uh, weaning Europe from its dependency on uh, Russian energy. Uh, we need to relook at uh, military options, including beefing up uh, the Baltics and uh, Poland to ensure that Putin understands. I mean, the question is, what would Putin do if he were in charge of NATO right now? You know he'd be moving troops to the border. Not necessarily, we can't do anything militarily in the Ukraine, but we certainly can make it clear that we will protect our interests in the region. And I'd point out two NATO countries have 25 percent Russian populations, so will our friend in Moscow tomorrow think that maybe they're not being treated well and Putin has a right to march into uh, Estonia and Latvia as well. These are the kind of questions we need to look at urgently. Okay. And Applebaum, sanctions are pretty useless, aren't they? Um, no, actually, sanctions can work. Uh, they've been extremely successful in reshaping the worldview of the Iranians. Um, what I, what's also extremely important in this case is, you know, this is a regime that is I I in which the, the, the business and the political interests of the leader intertwined. Um, it's also a regime who's, who's, who, who, although they, they rule in one country, they invest, um, they play, uh, they send their wives and children to live in Western Europe. Um, for a long time, this has been tolerated in Western Europe. You know, we're happy to, 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 to take their money. Um, it may be now to say, stop, it's time, as, as my American colleague says, to relook at this relationship, not only in terms of geopolitics, but also in terms of how much corrupt Russian money do we want in Western capitals? How much have we been really enabling this regime and allowing it to, to exist? And this may be the time to re-examine that question, too. Anne Applebaum, Alexander Nekrasov, and James Jeffrey and Sir Malcolm Rifkin, thank you very much for joining me.